After the likelihood ratio test struck back in part two, it's time for part three of this video series, the return of ANOVA. Now this plot on the front here is actually a simulation, where what I've done is I've taken a thousand random draws from a chi-squared distribution with six degrees of freedom, excuse me. Why six, you might ask? Well, remember in our toy example, we had n equals nine observations, we had k equals three groups, and under the last slide, we saw that the quantity SSE, which occurred in the numerator, should have been a chi-squared distribution with n minus k. Now, what I've done in the simulation is I've taken that quantity in the numerator and I've divided out by its degrees of freedom. Similarly, I've taken the quantity that appeared in the denominator from our likelihood ratio test statistic and divided it by its degrees of freedom, which in our example from the toy one would be eight. And I've done a thousand simulations and plotted a histogram of these ratios. And you can see that the result is this right skewed distribution and this black curve ends up being the correct descriptor of this distribution, which we're going to call an F distribution. And it has two degrees of freedom parameters. It has a degrees of freedom for the numerator, which in this case would be six. And it has a degrees of freedom for the denominator, which in this case would be eight. Now, in general, the F distribution is defined just in that way as essentially a ratio of two chi-squared distributions where each one is divided by its degrees of freedom. So to state that a little bit more rigorously, suppose that x1 and x2 are independent chi-squared random variables with two potentially different degrees of freedom, p1 and p2. Then the random variable f, which is formed by taking the ratios of each divided by its degrees of freedom, has what we call an f distribution with p1 and p2 degrees of freedom. Sometimes this is called Snedekor's f, and I put that in there because I just think it's such a cool name, Snedekor. Now, the offshoot of this is that if we return to our likelihood ratio statistic, we know that the SSE has a specific chi-squared, as does the SST. I'm not going to show that they're independent, but that is something that one can show, and it kind of would be an argument somewhat like what we did in the normal distribution when we were trying to show the independence of y i's and the y i, or sorry, the y bars and the y i minus y bars. But essentially, what we're going to do here is we're going to multiply and divide in lambda by the appropriate degrees of freedom. Okay, right. So our previous rejection region, remember, was lambda less than or equal to c. Well, if I take both sides of that inequality and I multiply and divide by the degrees of freedom that we need in our numerator and denominator, then I would end up getting some other potentially different constant here, but that doesn't matter. Excuse me, excuse that for a moment. Because all we're trying to do with our likelihood ratio test is get a generic form. And then once we know we have that form written in something where this is like a random variable x whose distribution I know, I can then use that random variable x which in this case is an F distribution, to derive critical values as up using upper tail areas, right? So this all seems well and good. It seems like we're done, except there's a little bit more because this test statistic right here is not typically the one that you'll see if you look up ANOVA in, well, basically anywhere in the world. So to make that connection, I want to first take a moment and step back and compare, recompare the simple linear model with ANOVA. So in our simple linear model, you'll recall that our response variable yi's were a linear function of the, the independent variables xi's plus some random noise. And in those videos, we actually introduced two quantities. This one we often called SSR in addition to SSE as the sum of squared residuals. But the sum of squared error of sum of squared residuals was the sum of the squared differences between the actual yi's. So here's the actual and their predicted values, whereas the sum of squares total was the differences between the actual and the overall mean of all the observations, the total variance. Right? So with ANOVA, if we make that same analogy, then the SSE okay, is basically like saying, what would I estimate these yij's by in my model? Well, up here it was y hat, down here is just the mu sub j's. So the yj bar squareds would be kind of the natural analog to the yi hats. 
So that's why this SSC here is really very similar to the SSCE we saw before. Similarly, with the SS total, I actually don't need to make any changes here except a change in notation, which switches from the single indexing to the double indexing and from the overall mean there to the notation region for the overall mean here. But you also recall that with a simple linear model, right, we had this decomposition which said that SST was an SSE term or SSR plus something else which basically measured the differences between the predicted values and the overall means. Okay, And my next goal is to show you that we can derive a similar decomposition for lambda, which allows us to get an alternative expression that is more commonly seen in ANOVA tests. So recall that so far, right, we start off, and I, for some reason, got a big lambda there. Let's switch that back to a little lambda. And we derived this ratio test, and we said, well, actually, I want to end up dividing these by their degrees of freedom, but we're going to ignore that for now. And we're going to try and rewrite this not in terms of SST and SSE, but in terms of the treatment sum of squares, which is the quantity you see more commonly occurring in ANOVA tests. So to do that, let's go back to an old trick, which is to take our SST, which is a double sum. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add and subtract the YJ bars within that quantity. The purpose of doing this is because this term in the middle, you could think of this as a decomposition of the air into two things. This first term right here is the differences within, within uh, the group, or what we often call the within group variability. And this one right here is a difference between groups because it's measuring how far that group mean differs from the overall mean. So if we multiply this out and use some of our typical algebraic arguments to write and decompose the sum in the middle in the appropriate way, the cross terms will cancel and we'll end up with these two sums right here. And the second one, this first one right here, is exactly the SSE, right? But for the second term, notice that there's no longer any I term inside these index. So if I do the I sum first, I will get N sub J. For every J, I'll get N sub J of the exact same quantity here. And this blue quantity here is what we often call the sum of squares treatment, or SSTR for short. The TR stands for, let me write it out and below it so you have a visual on it, stands for treatment. And in this way, we have this idea that the total variance is a combination of the within group variance and the between group variance. This one's the between groups, right? Okay. So if we use this decomposition as the total sum of squares by decomposing into these two smaller ones, we can rewrite our lambda as SSE over SS, well, I'm getting a little carried away with my S's there, SSE plus SSTR. And recall that our likelihood test had us rejecting the null if that was less than or equal to C. Okay. Now, if I invert both sides of this, I would get 1 plus SSTR over SSE is less than or equal to 1 over C. And that means that I could, sorry, this should be then a greater than, right? If I'm inverting each side, we should switch that to a greater. That means I am now rejecting the null if the sum of squared treatment over the sum of squared errors is greater than or equal to some quantity C star. Okay. 
And this kind of gives me a new form of a rejection region to work off of, right? Which now involves a ratio of the between group variability to the within group variability. And that's often something, something more, more commonly talked about when you're deriving no, ANOVA st statistics. Now, one more thing to note before we summarize all this in a, one simple slide is degrees of freedom. So we know that degrees of freedom are additive. And furthermore, I know that this quantity has n minus 1 degrees of freedom. I know that this quantity has n minus k degrees of freedom. So what does that leave left for the SST term? Well, I need to have something here so that when I add it to this, I get n minus 1, and that something would be k minus 1. So if I want to convert this test statistic into an F distribution, I would just divide, multiply and divide the numerator by k minus 1, multiply and divide the denominator by n minus k. And that then gives us our final summary results of what an ANOVA hypothesis is all about. Okay. So to review everything we've done at this point, the null hypothesis is that there's no difference in group means. Of course, that makes the alternative that there is a difference. What we're going to do to derive a rejection region is we're going to look at critical values from an F distribution with K minus 1 and N minus K. So the K minus 1 is from the treatment sum of squares. The N minus K is from the error sum of squares. And then finally, our test statistic is going to be the ratio of the SSTR and the SSER where we've normalized with sums of, with degrees of freedom in both. Okay. So we're going to be looking at this in R in a moment. But two more things I wanted to point out before we do that. This quantity here is often called the MSTR. There are so many abbreviations. Mathematicians are so fucking lazy sometimes. So MSTR, right? The mean squared treatment. Because we're sort of averaging out the sum of squared treatments by their degrees of freedom. Similarly, you can guess, big surprise, that this one's called the MSE. Right? And so I just wanted to point that out because we'll see those come up in R output. I also want to point out that really this F statistic, which is looking at a ratio of between to within group variability, keep saying that to yourself 10 times fast, is the reason for the name analysis of variance because we're analyzing the variances between and within groups. And before we look at some outputs in R, I wanted to give you a little bit more intuition. A graphic I found from Guru99, whoever that is, sounds, sounds pretty awesome, I guess. So there is actually a great way of thinking about why the analysis of variance is so important, even though at the core, analysis of variance is about a difference in means. So in this graphic here, which did not apparently use colorblind friendly, ones, but I'll just say that, you know, there's a blue, this is blue, red, and green curves. Okay. I should label them with the colors, but I wouldn't help if you're colorblind, so I'll just label them like that. Now, the graphic on the left, there is a high level of variance within the groups, and in the graphic on the right, there's a low level of variance within the groups, even though the actual difference between group means is the same in both. Now, looking at this picture, which of these two do you think has a stronger chance of rejecting the null hypothesis? Well, I'd hope you say this one, right? Because in these curves, even though the mean differences are the same as in the curves on the left, right? So the distance between the peaks is the same here, and here, and here. Because the variance is so low within the groups, I have almost complete separation. That really looks like a difference, whereas one on the left it looks like there's a lot of cross-contamination. So that's why when we're looking at the numerator, which is measuring the difference in means between groups, we need to normalize it by how much error there is within the groups to get a better sense of whether we can reject the null or not.